Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Thursday, 14 March, 2024. It is the 119th anniversary of the birth of Raymond Aron, who was born in Paris on this date in 1905. Aron's Introduction to the Philosophy of History, an essay on the limits of historical objectivity, has been praised as being among the best books on philosophy of history ever written. It was originally published in French in 1938. A revised edition was published in 1948, and the English translation was published in 1961. Aron's memoirs don't say much about the conception or the writing of the book, but he does provide an interesting contrast between listening to the lectures of Alexander Kojev on Hegel and what he himself was working on. Quote, Kojev began by translating a few lines of the phenomenology, heavily emphasizing certain words. Then he spoke without notes, never stumbling over a word, in an impeccable French to which his Slavic accent added a, added a certain originality and charm. He fascinated an audience of super intellectuals inclined toward doubt or criticism. Why? His talent, his dialectical virtuosity, had something to do with it. I do not know whether the speaker's art remains intact in the book that records the last year of his course, but that art, which had nothing to do with eloquence, was intimately connected with his subject and his personality. The subject was both world history and, his, and phenomenology. The latter shed light on the former. Everything took on meaning. Even those who were suspicious of historical providence, who suspected the artifice behind the art, did not resist the magician. At the moment, the intelligibility he conferred on the time and on events was enough of a proof, unquote. So even though Aron was clearly taken by Kojev's presentation, he wasn't converted by it. As he goes on to write a little further on, quote, the distance was immense between what I tried to think and to write in Introduction to Philosophy of History and what was taught by Kojev or Hegel, unquote. If Aron's introduction to philosophy of history wasn't straightforwardly Hegelian and it wasn't straightforwardly phenomenological, what exactly was it? In other episodes, I've characterized this book as an early instance of analytical philosophy, and it certainly is that. Uh, Georg Zimmel's The Problems of Philosophy of History, an epistemological essay, was earlier than this, in, published in 1982. 1892 in its first edition, and Heinrich Rickert's The Limits of Concept Formation in Natural Science uh, was published in 1902, so still earlier by a generation, although Rickert's book isn't usually classed as an analytical work of philosophy of history because it belongs to the tradition of Windelband and Dilty, which is something different. Rickert, I would argue, was analytical in practice, but his theoretical motivations were derived from neo-Kantianism, and Aron was as keen to transcend the pervasive neo-Kantianism of the time as he was to transcend Hegelianism. And Aron attributed to Rickert a neo-Kantian framework that was all-encompassing. As we'll see, all of them, Zimmel, Rickert, Dilthey, were in, influenced Iran, but he didn't pick up the torch where they left it off. And he he went his own path, you could say. Iran also wrote Clausewitz, Philosopher of War, which was published in 1976 with the English translation in 1983. And these two books, Introduction to the Philosophy of History and Clausewitz, Philosopher of War, are what is available in English translation of his philosophical reflection on history. But Aron also wrote an essay on the theory of history in contemporary Germany, Critical Philosophy of History in 1938, and Dimensions of Historical Consciousness in 1961. Neither of these have been translated into English, 
when Iran received his doctorate and up until 1968, it was a requirement to write both a thesis and a complementary thesis. So the introduction to the philosophy of history was Aron's main thesis, and the critical philosophy of history, which focused on the German tradition, was his secondary the thesis. Georges Congleham cites the uh, critical philosophy of history as beginning with the claim, quote, the traditional philosophy of history finds its fulfillment in Hegel's system. Modern philosophy of history begins with the rejection of Hegelianism. Unquote. That's a point that I've made several times already, though not as elegantly as uh, Aron puts it. The rejection of Hegel being a motivating force in 20th century philosophy of history. Uh, most philosophers of history want to distance themselves from Hegel, um, and some manage to much more effectively than others. But Hegel remains the, the what can we say, the 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 the, the boogeyman that people need to uh, be scared of still apparently. This rejection of Hegel also defines the thrust of Aron's historical thought, which seeks to entirely set aside Hegel, and he's mostly successful in that. In his memoirs. Aron sketches the content of critical philosophy of history. Quote, and this is the, uh, the work that's untranslated into English. Quote, the critical philosophy of history grouped together for purposes of analysis, four writers, Wilhelm Dilti, Georg Simmel, Heinrich Rickert, and Max Weber. Was this assemblage artificial, arbitrary, or justified by the resemblance of their approaches, the relations among the questions they posed? Wilhelm Dilti, born two years after the death of, death of Hegel, belonged to a different generation from that of the, others, the three others who were born around 1860. None of the four had devoted his life or his entire oeuvre to the question I posed to that work. Wilhelm Dilti was a historian before criticizing his own profession. Simmel's Geschichtsphilosophie occupies a modest place in his work. The great work of Heinrich Rickert, although it is probably the best known of his books, was contained within a neo-Kantian framework that was all-encompassing and within which the antithesis between the two kinds of science was only a small part. Finally, Max Weber, although he was always concerned with the methods of his knowledge well, as well as his knowledge of self, owes his fame to his work as a sociologist, unquote. I haven't been able to obtain the French texts of either of these books, Critical Philosophy of History or uh, uh, Dimensions of Historical Consciousness. But I did find several reviews in French of Dimensions of Historical Consciousness, one which was especially interesting by H. Rossier, which examines Aron's philosophy of history from a phenomenological perspective. But he also credits Aron with what he calls a pluralistic conception of history. And that's the first time I have seen this phrase uh, explicitly formulated. Rossier quotes Aron as saying, quote, tyrannical and aimless history without global unity, but with partial unities, such is the dogmatic philosophy of pluralism that weighs on one, on our historical consciousness. There would be no total whole, nor any meaning at all, unquote. And on this, Rossier comments, quote, when he speaks of tyrannical and aimless history, he is undoubtedly guided by the desire to free historical research from, from philosophical presuppositions, which often implicitly influence the historian's conclusions, unquote. This then connects the phenomenological theme of freedom pre from presuppositions, which I discussed in the episode on Ludwig Landgrim, to post uh conceptions of history that Rossier calls pluralist, and which I would probably call naturalistic. But naturalism is often pluralistic. Uh, well, not necessarily, but that's another question that I won't go into now. There was a somewhat of a phenomenological influence on Aron's thought, as is evidenced from the earlier quotes from Aron's memoirs. And elsewhere in his memoirs, he mentions conversations with Sartre and Beauvoir, Quote, I spoke to Sartre about Husserl and awakened in him a feverish 
curiosity, unquote. And he says that, quote, in studying phenomenology, I too experienced a kind of liberation from my neo-Kantian training, unquote. I mentioned the books not available in English, and I do hope that they eventually get translated, uh, to make the point that Iran's translated book on philosophy of history did not appear in a vacuum, and that Iran continued to write on philosophy of history throughout much of his life. Understanding of history seems to be something of a passion and a mission for Iran. A paper by Perrine Simon Nahum states, quote, history was his life's center. Above all else, the notion of history provided a framework for a philosophy that turned its back on the idealism of the preceding philosophical generation. Instead, it sought to rethink the inscription of the individual in the historical world in light of the tension between freedom and determinism, unquote. Aron's Introduction to the Philosophy of History, an essay on the limits of historical objectivity, as it indicates in the title, is putatively concerned with objectivity history. I previously discussed the problem of historical objectivity in my episode on George Trevelyan. Aron's book-length study of historical objectivity takes us much deeper into the problem and from an explicitly philosophical perspective, whereas Trevelyan was primarily writing an occasional essay from the perspective of a working historian. Trevelyan does make a salient remark um, about bias in terms of the uh, selection, the historian's selection of his topic. And this is an important observation, but it's only one of many conceptions of, of objectivity that have been uh, applied to history and the historian's task. Aron identifies three limits of objectivity, which in turn suggest three forms of objectivity that observe these limits. Quote, the idea of limits of objectivity may be understood in three different ways. Either scientific propositions beyond a certain extension are no longer universally acceptable, or they are hypothetically objective, subject to a certain arbitrary selection verified by experiment. Or finally, all history is both objective and subjected, subjective according to the laws of logic and probability, but prejudiced in favor of an individual or a period, which for that very reason could not demand universal agreement. In other words, where does science stop? At what point does it break away from decisions alien to positivist knowledge? How are presuppositions and empirical research combined?" Unquote. So Aron is working on pretty much the same problem that preoccupied Dilty, Vindelband, and Rickert, the relation of scientific method and scientific knowledge to human action, which is also always action in the context of history. Aron helpfully tells us in the introduction to his book that Quote, the book is dominated by two paragraphs that open section two and by those which close section four, unquote. In the first two paragraphs of section two, we find the same problem set out in slightly different terms. Quote, the science of the human past enjoys a unique privilege. It has to do with beings who have thought and whose life and conduct it wishes to rethink. Now there is good reason to distinguish between understanding which attempts to show a relation imminent in reality and the explanation of the inorganic or organic world. Man understands himself and he understands what he has created. Such, in short, is the basic distinction that we would propose between the two types of knowledge. However, we shall not have to use it. Only the difference between understanding, grasp of an intelligibility objectively given, and causality, establishment of causal rules according to the regularity of series will be important, unquote. This distinction between two types of knowledge Aron traces back to Dilty, and he discusses the long tradition of a distinctive form of understanding that the Germans call Verstehen. Where we reach the limits of scientific objectivity, explanation in terms of causality ceases, and we have only understanding to guide us. Section four that uh, Aron also singled out as being a significant 
brilliantly and significantly describing the whole project of the book is titled History and Truth, with the final subsection at the end of the book titled Historical Time and Freedom. So here's a part of that final section of the book. Quote, liberty, possible in theory, effective in and through practice, is never complete. The past of the individual limits the margin in which personal initiative is effective. The historical situation fixes the possibilities of political action. Choice and decision do not rise from obscurity. Perhaps they see, perhaps they are subject to the most elementary drives, in any case, partially determined if they are referred to their antecedents, unquote. Earlier, I quoted Aron on the aimlessness and pluralism of history. Here, Aron references an incomplete liberty and a partial determinism. This is a philosophy that distances itself from absolutes and deals in terms of limitations, qualifications, and conditions. And this is a much needed antidote for most of what we find in philosophy of history. And in fact, it reminds me of a favorite quote from Bertrand Russell, who held a similarly fragmentary and pluralistic view of the world. Quote, academic philosophers ever since the time of Parmenides have believed that the world is a unity. This view has been taken over from them by clergymen and journalists, and its acceptance has been considered the touchstone of wisdom. The most fundamental of my intellectual beliefs is that this is rubbish. I think the universe is all spots and jumps without unity, without continuity, without coherence or ordered orderliness of any of the other or any of the other properties that govern us as love, unquote. That's from Russell's book, The Scientific Outlet Outlook. I think that Iran held a similar view, not that's not expressed in that way that Russell puts it and is only in the background, but I think that's part of Aron's motivation in formulating his philosophy of history. And with that in the background of Aron's thought or something similar, his philosophy of history is an expression of this fragmented and pluralistic conception of the world, which for Aron becomes a fragmented and pluralistic conception of history. In light of this conception of history, Aron adds another location on the conceptual map of history that I mentioned in the episodes on J.G.A. Pocock and Friedrich von Schlegel. And this location is what Aron calls historical philosophy. Quote, our book leads to a historical philosophy opposed to scientific rationalism as well as to positivism. This historical philosophy would make possible the understanding of actual consciousness, of the passions and conflicts which stir man, and of the historical ideas of which only an abstract transformation is given by the ideas of the moralists. Since it is a national or class philosophy, it would in any case be a political as well as a scientific philosophy. For the whole man is at once the philosopher and the subject matter of the philosophy, unquote. Aron suggests here that this historical philosophy is a kind of philosophical anthropology. And he goes on to define how exactly his historical philosophy is related to what we might call traditional philosophy of history. Quote, this historical philosophy is also, in a sense, a philosophy of history, but only if one defines history not as a panoramic vision of man's whole existence, but as an interpretation of presence, present or past as linked to a philosophical concept of existence, or as a philosophical conception which recognizes itself as inseparable from the epoch which it interprets and from the future of which it foresees. In other words, the philosophy of history is an essential part of philosophy. It is at once both the introduction to it and its, and its conclusion. It is the introduction because one must understand history in order to think in terms of human destiny at any or every time, and the conclusion because there is no understanding of development without a doctrine of man. If one conceived of philosophy according to the schema of the deductive theories, such as such a double nature would be contradictory, contradictory, but it becomes intelligible in the context of the dialectic of life and mind, which ends in self-realizations of the being who places himself in history and measures himself by truth, unquote. 
here we see the wholeness recovered by way of the wholeness of the persons. Aaron's philosophical anthropology then supplies us with the unity that he denied to the world at large. So happy birthday, Raymond Aron, and thanks for listening.